Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Jonathan Maltz. Uh, this is Code Reviewing Like a Champion. Uh, if after this presentation you have any questions, comments, uh, concerns, jokes, you can send them my way through Twitter as at MaltzJ. Uh, if you forget that, it'll be down on the bottom right hand corner of all of these slides, so you can just look there to remember it. People on this side who are obscured by the podium, I apologize. Uh, so, how did I get up here talking to you about Code Review today? Uh, and to describe that, it requires a little bit of a story. Uh, so for the last four and a half years, until very recently, I worked at Yelp as an Android developer. And one of the things that always impressed me about Yelp uh, was Yelp's strong emphasis on code review. Uh, from the very beginning during my time there, from the very inception of its engineering team, uh, very early on they had a set of code review guidelines that were circulated that talked about this is how we do code review at Yelp. Uh, we had a code review mentorship program, so you were explicitly trained on the Android team for this is how you review code. And our technical lead at the time used code review as one of the major tools in her toolkit in order to help keep our code quality high. So I just figured this was sort of how every engineering team worked until about 18 months into my time at Yelp, I joined E24, which was a company that had recently been acquired uh, by Yelp. And E24 was very much a startup at the time. You would make your change and you would git push origin master and it would be live. Uh, and I was like, what the heck's going on here? Uh, <laughs> What, what is this? What doesn't everyone do code review? Uh, and I found out that apparently it's possible to have a very successful team that gets required for over $100 million and not do code review. Uh, but we knew that as part of bringing them into our wider sort of Yelp engineering family, we wanted to bring a culture of code review. But we couldn't just helicopter drop everything that had worked for us at Yelp into E24 and make it successful. So we worked really hard to understand what are sort of the fundamental tenets of code review that are applicable across organizations. And that's what brought this uh, presentation to life. So what will we talk about today? Uh, first we'll talk about why do code review in the first place. Again, it's clearly possible to just git push origin master and be very successful. Uh, well, then we, we'll talk about how to do a basic code review outline because I think sometimes it's easy to just be like, oh, I'm doing some code review uh, and not really think about the structure to making that happen. And lastly, we'll talk about how to give code review feedback. Because I think if you do, code review can be a really testy type of environment if you don't give feedback effectively. But if you do it well, it can be a really empowering situation. So first, why do code review at all? The first reason to do code review is it helps make sure that our code is correct. Uh, I assume that not many people have read all of Code Complete, which is this massive software textbook from Microsoft. Uh, but in it, they talk about some really staggering numbers uh, such as there was one team that was able to find up to 82% of its bugs in the code review phase. Now, I'm not going to say that if you start doing code review on your team, if you're not doing it already, you're going to have 82% fewer bugs. But having an additional person who's really going about evaluating the code in a structured way will help make sure that you catch those bugs before they go live. Next, we want to make sure that the code is well designed. Uh, everything that we know about software engineering over the past 25 years says that there is no one right answer. And the best way we as humans can deal with those types of problems is get a bunch of people together, talk about the different ways that we can solve it, and hopefully come out with a better solution as a result. This is one of the reasons the conversation that Joe was having earlier about diversity is so important. It helps us get these better ideas. Code Review allows us to have a forum where we're continually talking about how can we make this design better, how can we evolve our architecture, and how can we get the best possible design code. Lastly, Code Review helps us share knowledge. There's a very obvious thing in that if you have two people, one person looking at code before it goes live, in addition to the author, now two people know about that code. But there's another thing here in that it's impossible for any one person to stay up to date on everything that's happening in the Android space now. There's talks, there's blog posts, there's everything. And so Code Review provides an avenue for people to say, oh, I found this cool Rx Java operator in this blog post over here, let me share it with you. Uh, so that way a whole team can continue learning and growing. So with those goals in mind, let's talk about a basic outline for how to do a code review. So ironically, the first step in effectively doing code review is not to review code at all, is to take a step back and build context on what that change is actually trying to do. Uh, because it's really hard to understand if, a code, if code is correct and well designed if you don't understand what the code is trying to do in the first place. So success here is first and foremost understanding the what and the why of the change. So what I mean by that is there's two questions whenever you start reviewing a piece of code. The first is why are we writing this code in the first place? What is the, what is the user facing feature we're trying to do? What is the bug we're trying to fix? Why are we taking time to try to solve this? And then there's also the what, which is how, what is the algorithm that we're implementing? What is the, the tactical thing that we're doing in order to accomplish that goal? 
And it's important to understand both of these because what you might find is that someone might uh, implement, a, integrate a new library perfectly and everything will be according to spec, but that library doesn't actually solve the problem that you have in the first place. So it's important to understand both of those pieces. Now you also want to understand what is out of scope of a particular change. Uh, none of us are probably shipping 5,000 line changes in a single pull request. Uh, so there are some things that are going to be left out. There are going to be trade-offs that the author has made. And you want to understand those before you start reviewing code so that you don't go like, review a whole bunch of code and then the author's like, uh, I already considered all those things and if you just read the description, uh, you would see that I talked about that already. Not that I've done that before. Not that I've been the reviewer who's done that before. Because failure here is that you get really excited. And as some of you can probably tell, I get easily excited. Uh, and you start looking at the code and you're like, all right, we're going to talk about correctness, we're going to improve some design here, and you jump right into the code, and then you leave a bunch of comments, and you find out that all the comments that you made, the author has already considered those trade-offs, uh, and they already documented why they decided to go in a different direction. In which case, you've both made a poor use of your keystrokes and your time writing those comments, because the author has already thought about all those things, and the author uh, what's it called? And you also have then taken away time from the code review and the code review's velocity. The other piece here, which is a subtle one, is not calling for backup as necessary. Because especially at the boundary lines of your application, so when you're thinking about uh, calling out to an API or talking to an external service, it's very easy to perfectly implement that new retrofit call that's exactly according to what you want to do, but then you might accidentally, it might cause some problems on your back end that you totally didn't consider. So when you're thinking about correctness at the boundary lines of your application, make sure to call for backup from people who might be better versed on the other side of that service call to make sure that the code is fully correct. And the thing is, authors are just as important as reviewers here. Because it's really important for a reviewer, or it's really hard for a reviewer to understand the context of a code review if no one tells them what that code review is trying to do in the first place. So the good news here is that if you're using many modern code review tools, I know GitHub and Review Board, which we use at Yelp, do this. I imagine Crucible and uh, Fabricator and all the other major ones do this as well. But they'll take your commit messages and they'll automatically plop that into the code review tool. So if you're already doing a good job of writing good descriptive commit messages, you might not necessarily need to do anything more here. If, on the other hand, you're writing commit messages that are something more like uh, fix up or solve the bug, I'm so excited. Uh, then you might need to put a little bit more context into these pull requests in order to make sure that they're useful for your reviewers. Uh, and there's a link that I have at the end that talks about how to write these good commit messages, which will in turn make good context for a code review. And another thing that can be really useful here is pre-filled templates. So I know GitHub and Review Board do these. Again, I will extrapolate to Fabricator and everything else on the market and assume uh, that, they, that they have these. But basically the idea here is that a lot of these tools give you the ability to provide checklists for things that people should think about before shipping or questions that they should think about answering. Uh, and one of the best ways I ever saw this used was our core iOS team at Yelp. Uh, they had a template that said, uh, what is this change? Uh, what are the alternatives that considered? And what are the trade-offs that you're making here? So as part of the author posting that pull request, they had to think about what are the trade-offs that I'm making here? What are the other ways that I could be approaching this? So it forced the authors to level up their authorship, their, their sort of code writing and how they thought about it. And it also created a situation in which they provided that context to reviewers up front. So the next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is evaluate closer and start to think about correctness and design at the class or maybe the method level here. And when you're thinking about this, what I, I like to think about trying to provide what my friend, call, my friend Ken calls high value code review feedback. So these are things that humans are uniquely positioned to be able to provide. It's the ability to say, hey, this name doesn't quite describe what this class is doing. Maybe we should describe this class differently and use a different name here. It's thinking about how the system works as a whole and thinking, oh, maybe we need different tests here, or maybe we need to change the way we have test coverage for this, even though we might already have 100% test code coverage on this. Maybe there's another test case that's really important to make sure that our code is correct here. And lastly, it's that sharing new patterns. It's looking at something and saying, oh, I see that you used a, no, a switch map here, and maybe if you use this other combination of RX Java operators, it would be clearer or better, it would describe what you're trying to do better. Now the flip side is, if you're commenting on anything that a computer can catch for you, that's probably not a good use of your time and your brain power, uh, and it's slowing down that code review velocity. So check style is a great tool to make sure that your code is properly formatted. PMD, find bugs, error prone, catch a bunch of little things for you. Lint does the same thing. So use those liberally. If they're quick, run them on pre-commit. If they take a long time, run them on CI. 
But don't have these discussions over and over again where you're commenting on little things uh, that a tool could catch for you. And lastly, once you have evaluated at this sort of closer level, you want to take a step back. And it's important to have this as a structured part of the code review process because it's so easy to get caught in the weeds of saying, oh, this should be named better, or you might, you're missing an edge case here, and not think about the code as a whole. So what I like to do is I like to sort of, before I click submit on a pull request, I, want, I literally push my chair away from my desk and ask myself this question, could we be doing this easier? Is there a better way that we could do this? Is there a faster way that we could do this? And just iterate all the, out all the options that we have and see if there's sort of a macro, a macro level change that we can make to this in order to make it, the change as a whole better. And I found that this has helped create a lot of alternatives that might have otherwise got lost if I was just focusing on the specifics of what the change is doing. So with that idea of a code review outline in mind, let's talk a little bit about how to give feedback on code reviews. Uh, because if done well, I think code review feedback is one of the, like, it's one of my favorite times as a software engineer. Uh, more than when tests pass, I love getting good code review feedback. Uh, because really good code review feedback creates that discussion and that collaboration where we're able to talk about how can this design be better? How can we, how can we figure out how to do this thing in a new way that neither of us would have considered on our own? And it's an opportunity for us to learn from our peers and be really excited about taking this thing that we wrote and figure out how we can become better developers and make our code better. But at the same time, it's very easy to give feedback that's making people feel worse. And to sort of accidentally give this feedback which robs people of their autonomy and makes it so that this type of interaction stops being an exciting collaboration and starts being a rubber stamp that people need to work through in order to push their code to production. So how can that happen? We can, for example, give code review feedback that's like, your style here is inconsistent. Uh, align your braces with our code style. Uh, or this has a bug when it's running on, which will crash it on Lollipop, fix it. Both of these have really good intentions. They want to improve correctness. They want to make sure that the code is conforming to standards. But what they do is they provide this sort of dictatorial feedback, which is go do this thing, otherwise I'm not going to ship your code. And it can rob the author of that autonomy. The other thing we can do is have this subtle value judgment and say, why did you do this refactor? This code was better in its previous state. And then this type of thing makes it so that people aren't as excited. They're like, oh man, I put in all this effort. I like, applied my design patterns, and now it just turned out to be bupkis. Uh, so we want to try to make sure that we're avoiding these types of value judgments as well, so that people are excited about getting that feedback. And the thing is, with all of these, it's really easy to have good intentions, but if you're not conscious about how you deliver that feedback and how you deliver the message that you want, it's easy to get bad results. So the framing that I'm going to take from a friend of mine is, uh, he always likes to talk about code review as, this code is already good, let us talk about how we can make it even better. And there's a process for that that I like to use, which starts with de describing whatever change you think you should see with neutral facts. So an example of this, and I apologize for taking an example where we are talking about code style right after I told you to not talk about code style, uh, but I think it em embodies this situation really well, is uh, the style guidelines say that you should put braces on the same line, and this code puts braces on a new line. Like you can look at the code, you can look at the style guideline, you can see that there is different, there is no value judgment here, I'm simply stating a fact. And then we close this with a dictatorial thing, which says align your braces with the style guide. But we started this in a way that just, again, coming back to that idea of starting critiques with neutral fact-based feedback, much like we talked about with design relations yesterday, we started with that same type of unbiased feedback. Now there's a failure mode here, which is that you can turn, it's very easy to make your opinions uh, into facts. So an example of a fact, and I will apologize in advance to Yoon because I know you talked about static methods earlier today. Uh, so I apologize, I swear I wrote this months in advance. Uh, the, an example of a fact is that static methods can't be mocked in normal JUnit tests. You can try this, you will be sad, you will go use power mock to mock your static methods. This is a fact. An example of, a, of an opinion is that static methods are bad. They can't be mocked in normal JUnit tests. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to avoid static methods. They, make, they can make particular types of testing hard, they make dependency injection really hard, and it's why, as Yoon pointed out, a lot of people recommend against using static methods in object-oriented languages. But at the same time, I'm sure the, fa the functional programming devotees could come up here and wax poetic about the value of pure functions. Now, if you define all of your methods as static, you will have the perfect pure functional code base. So when you're, doing, when you're leaving this type of feedback, you're really conscious of when you're sharing an opinion versus when you're sharing a fact. 
And when you're sharing these facts, again, remember part of the goal here is to be sharing knowledge and patterns with your teams. So when you share that fact, make sure to provide more context by linking to external resources. So that you don't just say use a concat map here, but you show someone a marble diagram about what the concat map does and link to the RxJava docs where it says this is different than switch map in this way and, the other, and a normal map and flat map in these other ways. So the next step is to invite a discussion. Uh, and there's a really magical formula I have to invite a discussion, which is you take the thing that you think the author should do, you put the words can you in front of that, and then you end the sentence with a question mark. And congratulations, your feedback has now gone from a dictation to a discussion. Uh, and so an example here is that the style guide line says you put braces on the same line, this code puts braces on a new line. Uh, can you align your braces with the style guide? 98% of the time the response to this is, oh my gosh, I can't believe I made that mistake. I'll update the check style rules and I'll change that right now and then we'll never deal with this again. But you know, 2% of the time the author might say, oh, I can't do that because it does this other thing and I didn't quite know if that's right. What do you think about this third approach? And that type of discussion is much easier to have when you started this feedback as a question and initiated a discussion rather than given a dictation. And the last subtle thing I like to do is to replace the word you in my code review feedback with the word we or us. And this comes from that idea of collective code ownership. And it's that idea that if in six months, even if you wrote this code, I'm gonna be the person responsible for maintaining it. And then after that, in a year and a half, Chuki's gonna be the person for resp responsible for maintaining this. Uh, so no one of us owns this, and so what we're really doing is we're transforming the code that you wrote into our code as part of code review. So what we say here is the style guide lines say that we should put braces on the same line, and this code puts braces on a new line. Uh, can we align the braces with our style guide? So even once you have all of these, this like feedback mechanism in place, it, I've still found it is so easy to get into keyboard wars with people. And be like, no, we should represent, represent state this way. And someone's like, that's stupid. I like saw this talk over here that says state representation is terrible and you should, I don't know, do something else. Uh, program an assembly code. Use, use the NDK for everything. Uh, and it's, it's crazy because you two are like eight feet from each other and are gonna talk about what you're gonna have for lunch in five minutes. Uh, so don't do this. And the best way to avoid this is what my friend Alex calls the rule of three. And this states that after three back and forth on a code review, so reviewer, author, reviewer, you can no longer resolve that issue on the code review. You must discuss it outside the context of a code review. So that's Slack, Hangouts, face-to-face, -face, Carrier Pigeon, whatever you want to use, no resolving it on the code review. Uh, and the way I like to initiate those discussions is on a scale of one to 10, I care about this at like a five. What about you? What are your major concerns? And you might find that when you have this discussion, you find two totally different types of concerns. Uh, so I might care a lot about performance and you might care a lot about software design and a following a particular pattern because you believe it's extensible. We might be able to solve both of those with, to, just by changing the approach that we have. You might be able to get performant and extensible code. You might find that there's a large difference. So you might be at a 10 and I might be at a two. In that case, uh, I like to defer to the principal who cares the most in the code, of the person who cares the most in the code review. Uh, that is awfully wordy. Uh, just do what the person who cares the most wants. It'll make things quicker, it'll keep your velocity high. Now there's a caveat here, because if you're using this a lot, you can't always be the person who cares the most in a code review. If you're always a 10 and everyone else is always a two, it's probably not because like, people on your team don't care about code quality. It's probably because you like, have super strong opinions and you might want to think about dialing those back a little bit. So if you're using these, think about averaging out to a five. And lastly, you might find that both of you are, have a high number. And in that case, you're probably think, talking about a big decision where a code review isn't the great best place to describe that. Uh, so really big directional changes are not the best, code review is not a good place to talk about those and to decide those. Code review is great for correctness and design sort of at the micro level. But if you're at a, a really big directional point in your code base, you might want to take a step back and say, should we be making this change here? Maybe we need to make, write a design document or do something else in order to decide this. And lastly, don't forget to celebrate the good stuff. It is so easy to think, oh, I, I know how to give people feedback. I can just like not tell them when they do anything good and I'll, I'll give collaborative feedback and it'll be okay. Uh, but like, I promise you, the internet will not run out of plus pluses to dot emojis, like smiley faces. Uh, that was great, exclamation points. Uh, so use them liberally uh, because it will mean that your teammates will be happier uh, because you're celebrating the things that they're really doing well. Uh, and they know that when you're giving them that, that feedback, it's not just them failing all the time. It's you, finding, it's you both finding opportunities for stuff that's all right, that's really great, and opportunities for stuff that's also can be better. Uh, so that's all I got. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, talking about code review today. 
these are uh, some external resources that I have. Uh, the first ones are about uh, code review. Uh, the, middle, or the first ones are some blog posts. The middle ones are talks about code review. And the last ones are stuff about uh, communication and sort of giving feedback. Uh, so that's all I got. Thank you very much. I'll leave this up here for pictures.